Hello, I'm Father Gregory Pine, an assistant director at the Thomistic Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you back for this most recent installment of Off-Campus Conversations, where we follow up with a Thomistic Institute speaker, uh, so that way we can yeah, chase down some insights that they will have given by means of a lecture or a retreat conference or whatever else. Uh, so for this installment, I'm very delighted to be joined by Professor Mats Wahlberg. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so looking looking forward to chatting uh, pursuant to your lecture, but perhaps before doing so, um, some of our listeners will know you from from the aforementioned lecture. But for those who don't, could you say a word of, of introduction? Yeah, I work as associate professor at Umeå University, which is in the north part of Sweden. And it's a secular state university. Uh, I also taught for a while at the Angelicum, where I was the, the Aquinas chair for visiting scholars in 2021. And uh, I, have a doc I have two doctorates, one from Umeå and one from South Africa, Stellenbosch University. So I have been doing research about a number of different things about natural theology, the doctrine of revelation. I also recently studied the problem of evil and I'm working on a book on that topic right now. Okay. Wonderful. And those are, yeah, interestingly, those are all themes that a lot of students at Thomistic Institute chapters um, are interested in learning more about. And so we have quite a few different professors who lecture on problem of evil or the doctrine of revelation or the possibility of revelation, things of such like. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd be interested to, to read more. I wrote a little paper uh, for Father Thomas Joseph, uh, maybe whatever, 10 years ago on the problem of evil using the work of Herbert McCabe, which is uh, one kind of, or a particular kind of approach to the problem. Um, but then since then, you've had these big books from Eleanor Stump, from which I've profited, um, The Wandering in Darkness and the Atonement books. So it continues to be an interesting theme. But the lecture that you gave, the lecture that we're following up on, is a lecture about faith. Um, so how about we start there? Um, you were describing uh, kind of fundamental questions of how we, one, motivate the question of faith, but then also sympathize with the type of claim that faith makes on an individual um, insofar as, yeah, there's a, there's a logic to it or there's a kind of intelligibility to it. Um, and one thing on which you insisted was that you have to be clear on the, the object of faith. Um, so I think people hear object, they might not necessarily know what to make of that, but could you introduce us uh, to this subject matter, or introduce us to these considerations of faith, uh, specifically as concerns the object. Like, what does it what does it mean to say that there's something in reality that faith picks out, and how do we how do we cultivate a sense for that? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I would start by saying that uh, faith is is rather much misunderstood today in many circles that people identify faith as some kind of unjustified belief or mere belief, belief without uh, sufficient reason or sufficient evidence. And uh, one of the purposes of my lecture at the Thomistic Institute was to kind of dispel this kind of understanding of, of faith and to argue that it's plausible and reasonable to see Christian faith as uh, rationally justified to the extent that it can be called knowledge in the modern sense of knowledge. And I think that Aquinas uh, would agree with that assessment. Of course, he has the concept of scientia, which is, which is usually translated as knowledge in many contexts. But I, I, I think that that's a bad translation because knowledge as we use it today is a much broader category than scientia as Aquinas uses it. So Aquinas has also other words for knowledge like cog cognitio and notitia, which are less demanding concepts, you might say, than, than scientia. So the fact that Aquinas does not want to say that faith, Christian faith, constitutes scientia should not lead us to believe that he denies that faith constitutes what we today would call knowledge. I would insist that, that he, he would see faith as a version of, as a form of knowledge. And uh, when concerning your question about the object of faith, then, so Aquinas, of course, he distinguishes between the material object of faith and the formal object of faith. And 
The material object of faith considered in itself is simply the first truth, God. So God is the material object of, of faith. But considered from our perspective, from the standpoint of the knower, so to speak, or the believer, the object of faith is something more complex, namely propositions about God, because we cannot, we cannot know things uh, immediately in this life. We have to go by way of knowing propositions. So from the standpoint of us, the material object of faith are propositions about God and things related to, to, to God. And then we have the formal object of faith. And the formal object is simply the aspect under which something is known. So vis visual things are known under the aspect of, of color, for example, as Aquinas says. And uh, the formal object of faith is the aspect of being revealed by God. So uh, we, we know uh, the things we know about God through revelation under the aspect of them, those things being revealed to us by, by God. So it's the divine testimony, the, the divine uh, authority that kind of justifies our beliefs in the, in the uh, propositions of faith. I don't know if that's uh, for a start, it might be enough. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great for a start. And I'm thinking too, um, you know, so in light of the lecture as you introduced it or uh, the kind of goal as you were arguing for, um, so faith is not mere belief or unwarranted belief, but there is something to its warrant. I think it might be helpful to, to distinguish between like credibility and then fidelity because you know, it's one thing to say that, all right, there are a lot of miracles going on, or there's a lot of fulfilled prophecy, or the church is still around 2,000 years after the fact, and then to say, I believe in God. So I don't know if, you know, in your in your teaching or in your writing, you have good ways by which to illumine the, def the difference between, like, credibility um, and then, like, leaning on divine truth, that is to say, assenting to the first truth who himself speaks. I don't know if you have ways of maybe teasing that out a little bit. Yeah. So, so there are people who have interpreted Aquinas uh, in a kind of naturalistic way, which I recount in the lecture. And then they, they are often philosophers of religion who are not experts on Thomas. So they, they, they kind of have a rather superficial understanding of his, his ideas here. But they construe him as, as saying that, well, people believe in the Christian creed because they have a battery of arguments from reason about God's existence and they have a battery of arguments from history and from human testimony for miracles and the like that kind of underwrites the claim that God has revealed himself through the Bible, the biblical testimony. And then on the basis of this, uh, people believe the Christian message. Uh, but that's not how Aquinas thinks. So as you rightly points out, even though Aquinas completely acknowledges that there are good apologetic arguments for the faith of the kind I, I recounted here, uh, he wouldn't say that faith is based on those arguments. Instead, faith is based on the authority of the revealing God. So it's the authority of God speaking that is the formal object of faith that by which we know the things we know through faith. And uh, in my construal, at least, and in uh, the construal of many other people, uh, Aquinas sees the testimony of God to provide the proper warrant for belief in the Christian creed. So, so it's, it's the fact that God, it's a God who has revealed this, these propositions that warrants them and makes it justified for us to, to believe in, in, in them. Okay, well then may, maybe we can drill down on that claim a little bit. Uh, so you think of our 21st century secular contemporaries who aren't sympathetic with faith claims, um, and they might, say, they might say any number of things. So, okay, um, they might be of a kind of materialistic sort and say, you know, how do you have access to this noetically since it's not mediated by visible signs or it's not mediated by visible signs uh, according to a 21st century scientific paradigm. Or you might have people say, okay, well, to believe somebody, uh, 
by no further attestation than their own could be uh, like a recipe for disaster, like violence um, and manipulation and control and devastation. So uh, how could we look for other modes of kind of propping up the divine testimony or like, are, is there someone else who's going to testify to God? Um, or you, I mean, we can imagine all kinds of different objections, but uh, how do you, how do you help people to appreciate the starkness of that claim? Um, I mean, there's no real way of softening it, but there might be ways of giving people an entry into it. Um, are there, are there things that you use in those types of conversations? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a great, great point. Uh, so I think the first thing to understand is that what I try to do in the lecture and in my writing about Aquinas on faith is not to prove that there actually is such a thing as a divine revelation and that it's mediated through scripture and so on. So what I'm trying to do is to uh, explain how, if there is a divine revelation mediated through scripture, how uh, the claims that this revelation contains could be justifiably believed by ordinary people. So uh, in response to atheists who would say that, well, there is really no evidence for divine revelation and so on in, in, in terms of, of natural scientific reasoning or, or that kind of evidence, uh, I would say that that's a different discussion. That's an apologetic discussion than about the fact of divine revelation. So I'm involved in an explanatory project that kind of presumes the fact of divine revelation and then tries to explain how can this count as knowledge? How can this count as rationally justified? So that's kind of a response to the, to the first kind of considerations you adduced. And then the second question, uh, I mean, if, if you just say what I said in the last, my last remarks and just say that, well, uh, we believe on the basis of uh, God's own testimony and this is sufficient for justifying our belief then many people will have uh, a lot of questions as you as you rightly indicate here uh, and uh, I think in order to understand uh, how this this model can can be made plausible uh, we have to say a little something about testimonial knowledge in general and our dependence on the testimony of others for our uh, normal, ordinary knowledge about the world. So uh, most philosophers today, they, they would accept that testimony can uh, transmit knowledge. So you can get to know stuff by listening to, the, to what other people say and believing them. But then there are two schools of thought, basically. One uh, uh, philosophical school that wants to reduce the justification of testimonial knowledge to non, uh, to other sources than than testimony to non-testimonial sources. In the same way as there are philosoph philosophers who want to reduce the, the kind of uh, justification we get from perceptual states or perceptual experiences to other uh, forms of justification, for example, reasoning on the basis of mere sense data. So you can, instead of saying that I believe this because I see it, I can, I, 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 I can justify my, my belief by saying that I have certain sense data and uh, these sense, the best explanation of why I have these sense data is that there actually is an object before me that causes me to have these sense data. So you can also reduce uh, our normal talk about perception to more basic forms of justification. But, but many philosophers believe that this is a kind of dead end project, that you have to accept that there are certain basic sources of justification and that we are simply dependent on these sources and we cannot justify them further. And perception is one such source, memory is another source, and many philosophers today argue then that testimony is another source. So in the same way as you can acquire a justified belief simply by uh, remembering something, the fact that I remember that I ate egg for breakfast this morning gives me a good reason to believe that I actually ate egg for breakfast this morning, unless I have a defeating reason, some consideration that, that tells me that my memory might work defectively in this instance. So 
memory is a basic source of justification in the sense that it gives a prima facie justification for, for the beliefs it generates. A justification that can be defeated by other reasons, but if not, then we are justified in, in taking those beliefs at face value. And if they are true, they are constitute knowledge. And in the same way, many philosophers today argue that we have to see testimony as a similar uh, kind of source of justification, a basic source. So the mere fact that somebody tells you something can constitute a prima facie justification for believing uh, what this person tells you, unless you have reason to believe that there is something, something fishy with his testimony. For example, that he is a liar or he's, uh, he's uh, uninformed about the, 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 the facts of the matter and so on. Uh, and my, my uh, uh, construal of Aquinas' uh, view of how revealed knowledge is justified kind of draws on this, uh, this philosopher of testimony who argue that testimony is a basic source of epistemic justification. They are called anti-reductionism, uh, reductionists. And uh, if anti-reductionism is true, then I think that we can use this as an important resource for understanding how uh, belief in the divine message, in the Christian message, can be justified on the basis of God's own, own testimony. But I, I think the move I'm making here in response to your, to your uh, potential objections, or the second objection, is that, well, uh, it's always possible to ask skeptical questions, but sometimes we must simply admit that we are dependent on certain external factors in order to have knowledge. And this applies to perception, to memory, and it applies also to, to divine revelation or, or uh, beliefs that we acquire from divine revelation. So that's, that's one thing we could say. I, I could go on, but maybe we stop there for now. No, that's yeah, that's great. And I think that um, the analogy or the comparison between uh, sensory perception or, you know, like imaginative, memorative uh, retention, and then access, noetic access to divine revelation is helpful because uh, certainly like in St. Thomas's work, you have these analogies of infallibility, where it's like St. Thomas will say that the pertinent sense has infallible knowledge, knowledge like notitia or cognitia, well, notitia, of its proper sensible, but perhaps not of its common sensibles or accidental sensibles. And that the mind, you know, like with respect to simple apprehension, the mind has infallible knowledge of, you know, uncomplex or simple notions uh, or simple realities. And so, you know, St. Thomas wouldn't put it in terms of brute facts, uh, or he might not use the language of like the prima facie given. Um, but he has a sense that, yeah, these things just, they're the first things to fall onto the sense or the first things to fall into the mind. And so there's a kind of like primal quality, as it were, to the address of divine revelation, which uh, he just, he holds as a kind of infallible yeah, communication of a certain sort. And I, yeah, maybe maybe that's worth further inquiry. Um, I suppose when people make claims of infallibility, um, they find it difficult to grant because the standards of falsifiability or, or verifiability are so, yeah, foreign to their sensibilities, you know? Um, but like how do, yeah, maybe maybe how on this created analogy, whether you want to use it or not, doesn't, doesn't matter too terribly much, but how do, how do we begin to understand this claim of, infallible access, infallible noetic access to divine revelation. Again, if there are other kind of created images that you have ready at hand that help, those would, those would certainly be, be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one, one thing that should be said is that uh, if you are in a position, in a fortunate position, so you're, you're, you're let's, let's take ordinary testimony as an example instead of divine testimony. You're meeting a person who testifies to some fact and let's say that it's, it's the case that this person really knows what he's speaking about and is sincere, then you are in the good epistemic position, according to uh, many philosophers of testimony, because uh, knowledge then of this fact is available to you. But you could also be, be in a bad epistemic position in the case 
where you meet a clever liar, for example. And in such a case, such a case, let's call it a bad case, it might be indistinguishable from your perspective from the good case. But it could still be the case that your epistemic situation, your epistemic standing in relation to this fact that you want to have access to is different in the good case and in the bad case. And if that is so, if that's the case, that it's a difference between these two cases in terms of your epistemic standing, then it follows that you are not in complete control of your own rationality, so to speak, because you're dependent on the external world and other people doing favors to you, so to speak. You're dependent on the reliability of other people's testimony for not only for whether you have knowledge or not, but also for whether you have a rational standing with respect to that knowledge or not. And I think that this kind of dependence uh, on favors from the world, so to speak, must be accepted because otherwise we will end up with a lot of philosophical problems if we try to construe our reason as kind of in autonomous control in an inner sphere where we, we, we if we do everything right, we can totally control our own rational standing. So we should we should accept that that our minds are not uh, encased in 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 the head, so to speak, but reaches out in the world. So it's a part of our rational standing can be constituted by relations to to things in the world. But then I, I think we should also say that in order to have a rational standing with respect to some piece of information, in order to have a justification for a certain claim. You have to exercise reason. You have that's 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 an exercise of reason. And this means that you are required to be sensitive to considerations and evidence that speak against the veridicality of your uh, of the one who testifies to you or the veridicality of your perceptual experience, if, if that's what we're talking about. So you have to be sensitive and on the lookout for evidence that kind of seems to indicate that you are in the bad case. If you have this kind of rational sensitivity, so you do your best to try to avoid being in the bad case and you're on the lookout for signs of deception and the like. And if you then in fact is in the good case, you are in the good case in fact, then uh, what results from you believing the testimony in question is knowledge. If you in fact are in the bad case, well, yeah, then you don't get knowledge and you, you have a worse rational standing, a worse justification than you think you have. But uh, that's life. We cannot, there are certain kind of bad situations we cannot, we cannot uh, control for. We cannot always make sure that we avoid these kind of bad situations. But if you have, uh, and, and in the case of divine revelation, I, I think, uh, the, the standards for accepting a claim to divine revelation, somebody says that this is a message from God, are rather high. So reason dictates that we should have a basic suspicion towards people who claim to speak for God, for example. And that's why Jesus made miracles, a part of the reason why he made miracles, to kind of defeat this natural rational suspicion towards his claim to be the Messiah. and. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there, in, in, that, in, in that sense, apologetic arguments are important to kind of defeat these uh, reasons that would make it toxastically irresponsible to believe the divine testimony. Uh, in order to have defeaters for those reasons, we have to have some kind of uh, counter reasons, for example, miracles then, or, or testimony about miracles, or the history of the church and the kind of apologetic arguments you refer to in, in, in the beginning. So I think they are very useful. And for some people, at least for professional philosophers, they, they might be necessary for it to be reasonable and responsible for them to believe in divine revelation. While if you take an, uh, an ordinary person who doesn't know all the philosophical objections to claims about divine revelation or to God's existence and so on. Such a person can be can responsibly believe claims to divine revelation uh, without perhaps having elaborate arguments for God's existence and so on. And and so 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 my point here is that uh, 
whether you're responsible or not when you believe uh, divine claims to divine revelation depends on your uh, personal situation, which era you live in. During the Middle Ages, there were certain demands put on reasonable persons. In today, there are other demands due to the fact that we have more knowledge in the natural scientific sphere and so on. Um, so it is a person relative notion, this, this notion of doxastic responsibility that's necessary for kind of absorbing divine testimony in a way that yields knowledge. Yeah. So um, it's interesting. As you describe what you describe, I'm thinking of the analogy of noetic access that St. Thomas gives at various points in the first four questions of the Secunda Secunde, where he talks about the difference between or among doubt and suspicion and opinion and knowledge. And so I'm thinking on the one hand of the approach of many contemporaries who will begin skeptically uh, in matters of faith or matters of religion. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, those who begin somewhat, I suppose the word would be ingenuously, you know, like, uh, or overly earnestly, or they do so in such a way as to kind of go in for all the latest uh, faith-based or religious fads. Um, and so you describe, you know, doxastic responsibility as being uh, open to defeaters, or at least susceptible to defeaters, um, to have your antennae up so that you should, should something transmit in the order of not true, you know, you're, you're sensitive to that. I wonder, like, yeah, what, just the, the, the individual listener trying to translate to his or her experience, what is it like to be genuinely open to the revelation of God whilst not permitting yourself to be taken in by things which would ultimately undermine your relationship with God, those things, you know, kind of posing as faith claims or posing, posing as true religion? Um, yeah, what, what, how, how would you um, kind of describe that epistemic state uh, if you can, if you can at, at any greater length? Yeah, that's a very, very good uh, but difficult question. I, I, I would start by saying that I don't think that God ever wants us to uh, believe something that we seem to have good reason to disbelieve. <laughs> so we, uh, I, I think that if God, since faith is a is a gift of God and it's divine grace that that causes faith, uh, I think that God. Uh, will make sure that you're never required by faith to believe something that you, you take yourself to have over strong overriding reasons not to believe. So in, in such cases, I would, I would suspect uh, or guess that God uh, first kind of disposes you towards faith by removing some of the objections you might have to faith, and then uh, the act of faith can, can follow. So it's not that God would mechanically cause you to make an act of faith, even though you take yourself to have strong arguments against God's existence or something like that. Um, so so I, I think when it comes to susceptibility or openness to divine revelation, I, the, the hypothesis I suggest in, in the talk is that God, uh, by his grace, can make it pl seem plausible to persons, to different kinds of persons, that the Christian message is actually revealed by, by God. And he can do that in a way that is adapted to each individual's unique situation. So when it comes to a professional philosopher, he will do it in a different way than somebody who has never heard about the five ways of Thomas Aquinas or something like that. But I think it's necessary, uh, right? I think that it's at least very fitting that God does this. And if he if he does this, then uh, he enables people to respond to divine revelation in a doxastically responsible way, without overriding any dictates of reason that 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 are are are. Uh, required that rational persons must must follow um okay so may maybe just to kind of follow this out further um i think what might cause maybe trepidation or even horror in a certain secular listener for whatever reason i have this individual in mind probably because it concerns faith but um is this idea of 
kind of seeding control or seeding freedom or maybe seeding inquiry uh, by, by saying, okay, I consent, um, I believe, I confess my belief. Um, there's something that I find not, not so much like comforting as emboldening. When St. Thomas describes the act of faith, you know, he divides it into belief and confession, these interior and exterior dimensions, and he describes the interior act of faith, namely belief, as cum ascensione cogitare, like quoting St. Augustine. So there's the idea here that, you know, there's a sense, uh, and yet there's this ongoing cogitation of a certain sort, which some authors will describe as mental unrest, not in the sense of doubt or calling into question the veracity of the divine testimony, but an inquiry which pushes on towards or which continues to further its pursuit on, until such time as it arrives at vision. Um, and I, th I th yeah, I think that this, this note of mental unrest is on the one hand a kind of healing balm for um, the, the misdirected trajectory of doubt, um, but also like a kind of um, elevating, uh, ennobling feature that we can recognize in, in man the capacity for such like discourse. So I don't know if you could say something about, um, you know, like you believe the testimony, you accept the testimony, you lean on the testimony, you take it for true, uh, and yet you're still inquiring, you're still cogitating. What about this note of, of mental unrest? Where does that fit in the picture? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I think first we should distinguish between uh, the psychological dimension here and the epistemic dimension. So it's possible to have a complete, completely secure epistemic standing or justification with respect to Christian belief, and at the same time have a lot of psychological unrest or, or, or uh, thoughts that kind of pop up in, in the brain. So uh, I think that's that's important to to distinguish. And if if the model for how uh, Christian beliefs are justified that I suggest in my talk is correct, then the epistemic standing of a subject is dependent totally on the fact that he or she is related to the divine testimony in a certain objective way. So you you have an objective relation that gives you the, the, the epistemic justification for, for the faith. But that's compatible with, with, with even with having certain doubts about, you can, you can, in certain moods, you can raise questions about the veracity of, of belief and so on. But on the epistemic level, you still have a, a strong justification. And, and that follows from, from the claim I made earlier that justification is not only some internal status. It's not something that only concerns our internal states. It concerns how we relate to the objective world, and in this case, to, to, to the divine testimony. Um, so so that's, that's one thing I, I, I would say. And uh, uh, I also think that, of course, that faith seeking understanding, I mean, is relevant in this context. So you have faith and uh, you have certain basic convictions, but that those don't solve all problems. So uh, as Cardinal Newman said, we can have a lot of a lot of problems, but they don't amount to a single doubt or something like that. So 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 you don't need to doubt in the proper sense. Uh, uh, Christian creed just because you see problems with it you can see it as a work in progress and I mean if you you can connect this to to uh, contemporary philosophy of science which uh, acknowledges that all scientific theories that people uh, at some point hold are, uh, are are have contain anomalies things that are problems for the theory and that needs to be solved but uh, it's not that's not a reason to aban abandon the theory so even that's kind of a natural analog to this state you 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 might have a lot of questions and there are some problems that you see with with the christian faith but uh, that's not a reason to kind of doubt it it's just a reason to continue the inquiry as as you as you said hmm. um yeah maybe you know we have time for maybe one more question and i'm thinking about um you know, after having described the object of faith and the act of faith, St. Thomas passes to a description of the virtue of faith. Uh, so this idea of cogitation or of uh, further inquiry, it opens our 
uh, it opens our mind to the possibility of a kind of habit of mind or habit of heart, which conduces to better and better exercise, where be, whereby it becomes you know easier and prompter and yet more joyful to engage in this type of activity. Um, and you know that the virtues have a, a healing and kind of growing, as it were, or elevating potency or power to them. And so there's a sense in which it can become, it can become, yeah, I suppose, better for us, uh, progressively better for us as we make the effort to believe. Um, and, 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 you know, for those who are on the outside, as it were, for the, for the doubter, for the skeptic, for the 21st century contemporary who will have no uh, place in his kind of epistemic universe for these types of claims, it's like it's perhaps seen as drinking the Kool Aid and then getting getting drunk on the contents thereof. But um, how might yeah how might this idea of habituation you know with the theological virtues I suppose it's peculiar but how might this idea of habituation and the the kind of virtuous dimension help further for us to understand the certainty that faith affords uh, the life that faith bestows uh, and the type of justification that that warrants it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's an, an interesting question. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I mean, St. Thomas says that the, the theological virtues, including faith, are kind of imperfectly possessed by us due to the, yeah, due to the greatness of God and his our ability, inability to know the essence of God. So we cannot, faith, even though faith is, a very high virtue, it's higher than the natural virtues and so on, uh, it's still imperfectly possessed. And that means that in order to, to do acts of faith in a proper way, we are dependent then on the additional gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the gift of understanding, intellectus and, and knowledge, scientia. Uh, and these gifts, I think, are, are important in this context to kind of... Uh, explain how the virtue of faith can operate in a progressively better way as we become more open to the holy the impulses from the holy spirit so the 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 gifts of the holy spirit with regard to faith are gifts that make us amenable to the impulses of the holy spirit so we so we are kind of guided by the holy spirit in our life of faith we we our acts of faith are are guided by di directly by the Holy Spirit through, through these gifts, and I think that's an important dimension here. Um, then, when it comes to habituation, I don't know if I have so much to say about that. But uh, of course, I think that's a kind of uh, universal or very common experience that that uh, people grow in their faith and they somehow become more and more confident in their faith, even though we also have, of course, the, the dimensions of the Christian life that the mystics point to, St. John of the Cross, for example, the dark, dark night of the soul and, and so on, where faith really flowers. So the dark night of the soul is the night of faith because uh, we relate to God through the virtue of faith in that night, in that night, but we don't see anything and we see even less than we think we see now before we enter the night of faith. And so faith, and a very strong faith, is compatible with, with uh, all kind of confusion and all kind of darkness and, and, and uh, um, seeming lack of light on the conscious level, I think. And that's an important dimension to take into account. So, so people don't believe that, well, the life of faith is just a, a constant, uninterrupted progression where everything seems to get better all the time. It can also seem to get worse in some ways. <laughs> And, but that's part of the process, and it's a necessary part of the process. Uh, I, I think then when it comes to this fundamental or, or you, the, the, the kind of uh, critical, skeptical question that you also alluded to now, now the last time here, uh, about whether this is just drinking the Kool-Aid and uh, if, if, if Christians... Uh, to easily accept that they are dependent on that they make an act of faith that they cannot by their own autonomous powers guarantee the veridicality of. Um, I, I think that in that case, I think a, 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 an al analogy with the knowledge, ordinary knowledge is very useful because uh, 
uh, David Hume, he tried to argue that, well, we can, we can gain knowledge from testimony, but only because we have independent evidence for the reliability of testimony. So we have a general knowledge that testimony in general is reliable, and therefore we are justified to, to rely on what people say in cases and so on. And how, does, how, do, how do we get knowledge of this general reli reliability of testimony? Through induction, Hume says, it's by the experience that testimony usually corresponds to the way the world is. So we can see the veracity of individual pieces of testimony, and then we can draw a general conclusion about the general reliability of testimony. And, and that's why we're justified in believing in testimony. The problem with this argument is that my own personal experiences of the reliability of people's testimony is very limited. So I, I cannot, from my own very narrow inductive basis, draw the conclusion that testimony in general, among all people, is reliable. In order to draw that conclusion, I have to have more information. And how can I get that information? Well, only by means of testimony, only by listening to what other people say about their experiences of, of people's testimony and so on. But that, then the argument gets circular, because then I... I am presupposing the reliability of testimony in order to get the inductive basis for, for uh, concluding to the general reliability of testimony, and that's unacceptable. So whether we want it or not, we seem to be dependent on simply taking people's words for things, even though we at the same time exert a critical uh, rationality surrounding that, that assent to what people say. But we cannot expect that we have... Uh, prior arguments that, that kind of ensure that we always only listen to, to veridical testimony. So there is a kind of basic, I think, uh, faith element also in our relationship to ordinary knowledge that is kind of analogous to the faith relationship we have to relig religious knowledge and to God. And I think that's important to point out to people so they don't think that, well, religious people, they have to trust Non-religious people, they don't have to trust, but they <laughs> they do have to trust, they too. Yeah. They have to trust their senses. They have to trust their experts. They have to trust the, yeah, the guild, as it were, broadly conceived. Um, well, thanks very much. Thanks for this conversation. Uh, thanks for exploring these subjects. Um, I'm, I'm certainly profiting from it as I'm thinking about how to reteach the faith portion of the course that I'm currently engaged uh, in teaching at the House of Studies uh, because we just finished the treatise yesterday. So I'll have to incorporate changes the next go around. But um, if folks uh, have an interest in following up with you on these subjects, are there places where you've published or places where they can, you know, find your work? Yeah, they can go to my website at Umeå University. I can also, I have uh, written about testimony and uh, in this book, Revelation as Divine Testimony from 2014, where I kind of recount these kind of arguments that I have sketched today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Father Gregory. It was great talking to you. Yeah, thank you. T turning then to you, the listener, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. Um, yeah, we look forward to chatting with you at the next opportunity. Know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And we'll look forward to, yeah, look forward to the next time on Off Campus Conversations on the Thomistic Institute podcast. Cheers. <laughs>